first slide. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's hosted by the Refinery Unit Department of Medicine, and today is the 20th of October 2021. So the title of our CPC is Journey to Diagnosis in a Woman with a Recurrent Effusion. So I welcome everyone who has joined us uh, either via Zoom or the live stream on Facebook. Okay, so first, uh, let me just introduce uh, everyone who's here. Uh, so I'll introduce myself first, Andrea, and I'm the consultant chest. Main presenter today is Dr. Ratika, and she's actually the medical registrar in our working in the uh, Department of Medicine. Uh, below the following six are the presenters and the panelists. There's Dr. Ng Boon Hao, who is the respiratory fellow, Dr. Aida, who is the radiologist, Mr. Isham, who is actually the cardiothoracic surgeon and current head of cardiothoracic unit, Dr. Karun Najmi, a gastro fellow, Dr. Wan Shahira Ilani, who is a pathologist, and last but not least, Dr. Siva Kumar, who is our our uh, in-house hematologist. So we'll move on to the next slide. So um, we'll start off with the case presentation. So I would like to invite uh, Dr. Ratika to go through the case presentation and then we welcome any further questions from her regarding the case. Thank you, Dr. Ratika. Uh, thank you, Prof. Andrea. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be presenting the case summary of the abstract given by the team. Uh, my patient is a 69-year-old woman presented with a two-month history of abdominal pain, constipation, and reduced effort tolerance. She had a history of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma of the colon 20 years ago. Clinical examination showed blood pressure of 130 over 80, pulse rate of 78, temperature of 37 degrees Celsius, an oxygen saturation of 95% under room air. On auscultation, there was decreased breath sounds and stony dullness on percussion of the right lung. Other systemic examinations were unremarkable. Okay. Um, the investigations, which is based on the clinic. Based on the findings, I think this patient has a right rural effusion needs to be further investigated. So, um, so, so you think that it's a right rural effusion because there's so many down. Um, can I just ask whether uh, you would, uh, uh, what would you consider as your uh, diagnosis at this point? With regard so her unilateral, unilateral pleural effusion, uh, the possible differential diagnosis at this moment of time can be infective cause, which is either paranemonic or TB. Uh, it can be due to malignancy, as the patient has underlying uh, lymphoma, which is uh, diagnosed 20 years ago. Okay, is there any uh, question you would like to ask regarding uh, to, to narrow down your diagnosis? Anything you want to ask me about the patient? Um, with that's to eat, uh, I would like to ask whether if this patient has any history of fever prior to this, uh, any night sweats, okay, right. any loss of appetite, loss of weight, any TB contact. Okay, so um, she's got none of that. Uh, so now we'll move on. So you narrowed your diagnosis down to either TB or malignancy. What about pneumonia, uh, clear-cut pneumonia? Would you consider that? Uh, Actually, with regard, uh, since there's this uh, blood investigation showed, uh, the full blood shows there's no race, sorry, there's no race infective markers. Um, the ES, the CRP is also not raised, so I don't think this patient has any pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia uh, at this point of time. Okay. Otherwise, the liver function test shows low albumin with a fairly normal renal profile and uh, TB will cut Mantuk seem to be negative. Okay. Right. So, okay. So is there any other imaging that you would ask for? Any imaging that you would like to confirm your diagnosis of? Uh, the very first imaging I would like to ask for is chest x-ray. Okay. All right. So we'll give you the image of the chest x-ray. Okay. Please describe the chest x-ray. If this were the exam, you get five marks for it. 
So this is a chest X-ray PA view. Uh, from the chest X-ray, we can see the trachea is fairly in the central. There is right lower zone uh, homogeneous opacity with blunted costophrenic angle. Probably there is, uh, seems like there is a right pleural effusion over the right side. As of the left side, the costophrenic angle is not blunted and there's no any other obvious consolidations noted. Yes, Dr. Ratika, you are correct. What you describe is correct. So what do you want to do next when you see these are check issues which is suggestive of a pure effusion? Since I've been the blood uh, test, I uh, go for bed diagnostic and therapy, uh, diagnostic uh, very plural. Good. So you may consider uh, medical drugosynthesis. synthesis. Okay, this is the result that we have. Can you interpret the results? I would, with regards to the plural fluid, um, the, the protein and LDH is important when we, want, we would want to count the criteria. So at this moment of time, the protein is more than 0 0.5 and the LDH is more than 0 0.6, which is suggestive of exudative plural effusion. And since it's exudative, it can be due to um, infection, paranumony or TB, uh, in which we have out parent uh, bacterial cause since the CRP is not raised. Uh, TB. Uh, the next, the next uh, sentence will be AFB directs me MTB culture were all negative, so we've already ruled out TB. And the next possible cause can be malignancy. But since there is a PG rate, uh, the triglyceride in a plural fluid is raised, and total cholesterol is one point six. Uh, can I ask for a picture of the plural fluid? Yeah. You, are, you are thinking why uh, we send this uh, yeah. plural fluid triglyceride and cholesterol, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, right. Uh, what you mentioned are correct. So, this uh, based on the plural fluid so ratio, protein ratio to the serum protein ratio, and also the LDH, um, this suggested for exudative. So as you mentioned earlier, the one of the differential diagnoses is to think of palmitic tuberculosis. So that's why the pure fluid was sent for the TB workouts, and because of background history of diffuse last D cell lymphoma, um, and cytology was sent to look for the differential different cell count. So uh, the reason the serum the pure fluid triglyceride was sent because when we perform the pure synthesis, this is what we seen. So there's a Mickey Wright's microscopic appearance. This is the reason why the pure fluid tree triglyceride right, and cholesterol was sent for these patients. Yes. So, um, so Dr. Ratika, so um, well, I, I gave you the basic blood test and also the uh, pure synthesis uh, findings. Any other further question would you like to ask to narrow down your differential diagnosis in these patients? Since uh, from the plural fluid, it shows chylothorax. So um, the very first question I want to ask is if there is any reason trauma to the trauma to the neck area or any reason instrumentation or surgery involving the neck or chest area. Uh, I would like to further ask regarding her malignancy status to make sure there's no any relapse of lymphoma because uh, chylothorax also occurs in malignancy. So um, does she have any altered bowel habit, any significant loss of weight, constitutional symptoms such as loss of weight, loss of appetite? Uh, and on examination, if there's any palpable limb nodes? Yeah, Dr. Ratika, um, to answer to your questions, uh, you look this, uh, there's no, uh, let me adjust this one. To answer your questions, there's no recent history of trauma. The patient neither have any surgery, but she did have uh, underlying uh, diffuse last B cell lymphoma, but uh, she's in remission for almost 20 years. And there's no other symptoms to suggest infections or any uh, GI symptoms. 
Okay, so you look at this differential diagnosis of chirothorax, I has uh, narrowed down it. Other than the uh, background history, last tissue, last piece of lymphoma, there's no other uh, uh, history suggests other differential diagnosis. Okay, so um, well, uh, what is the next investigation? Do you think they want to do to to to, to assist in your diagnosis? Uh, the next investigation that I wanted to do is um, I would ask radios help for lymphangiography. Sorry. Okay, so uh, what you ask, you will receive, I think. But in the meantime, maybe we just talk about the program. Okay, uh, well, um, this proceed with more invasive uh, investigations. So this patient had been initiated on the mediation guys, right? The reason being doing this to reduce the production of chylus. At the same time, uh, the Sardinger chest tube, the small ball chest tube was inserted because she having a symptomatic dyspnea. Um, however, she failed to respond to the uh, strict diet restrictions to the median strength chylus, right? So, uh, and the chylus occurred, okay? So, uh, yeah. Okay, so I think, uh, Ratika, you mentioned you want to do some procedure which is radiologically based. So uh, I would like now to uh, invite Dr. Aida Widuri, our radiologist, uh, to present her slides. Okay, <clears throat> uh, I want to share my slide. Can you stop sharing, Dr. Boon? I cannot share my slide. Well, Dr. Boon, yeah, okay, thank you. Dr. Aida, I invite you to share your slides. And uh, Dr. Ratika, you can continue to think of the questions that we want to ask you. Okay, so this patient, uh, we wanted to determine okay, so, if there's... Uh, uh, before Dr. Aida begins, uh, Dr. Ratika, uh, is this the reason why you actually want to ask for the lymphangiography, the title of Dr. Aida's slide? Can you please read it out? Yeah, determining the leak site. Yes. Um, okay, all right. So what, what you, you ask, ask, you shall get. Yeah. Uh, I welcome Dr. Aida to share her thoughts. Yeah, thank you. So we wanted to see if there's any uh, leak site that would be reversible and could help the patient. So the first procedure that we did was a right inguinal and auxiliary uh, lymphangiography. So how it is performed, basically, we identify a um, inguinal lymph node, um, either left or right, uh, with an ultrasound. And then using a spinal needle, we inject a contrast agent called lipiodol. Lipiodol is a heavily iodinated uh, ethyl ester, and it can travel um, inside the um, through the lymph nodes and also in the lymphatic vessels, which can delineate the anatomy. Mm, so where do we inject? We inject at the um, transitional zone between the cortex and the hilum of the um, uh, lymph node. Uh, Dr. Aida, can we stop for the press a short while?
Okay, thank you. We'll continue now because uh, the press have finished. Uh, okay. Yes, thank you very much. So I will continue. So, um, so um, after we've inject during the injection of the lipodol, we subject patient to spot radiograph to see the uh, lymphatic pathways as outlined by the contrast. So here is uh, the images taken from this patient's uh, study. So in the first image, here, you can see the needle uh, within the lymph node on the right inguinal side, and these are the lymphatic channels. And this is an example of a node that has been opacified by the lipodol, and all the thin lines uh, are, represent, are representative of lymphatic channels. Uh, as the study progresses, uh, we noted that the lymphatic channels up to the inguinal has been opacified, but um, no contrast is seen beyond the uh, inguinal region and after even the uh, 24 hours uh, abdominal radiograph taken the next day. Also, we couldn't uh, appreciate any um, contrast within the thoracic duct or any leakage within the abdomen. Usually, ideally, during this procedure, we would like to delineate the um, inguinal uh, lymphatic pathway up to the thoracic duct. But in this patient, um, it, it, it kind of halted at the inguinal region. And also here, we can see some uh, leakage of contrast into the surrounding tissues. So all in all, the uh, lymphangiogram of the right inguinal did not really um, was definite for any leak uh, due to um, halted um, uh, lymphatic um, pathway along the uh, thoracic duct. So then we did a right axillary lymphangiography and the reason we chosen the right side is because the pleural effusion was on the right side. So we know that during from anatomy that all the um, lymphatic channels from the right side will drain in to the um, right side clavian vein on the right side. So in this radiograph, you can see that there is reduced lung volume and there is um, the visceral pleura is not up to the uh, chest wall, oops, sorry, of the rib. And uh, there is void of vascular uh, markings. And also it appears um, to be homogeneously, um, uh, uh, um, how do you say it should be radio radioopaque, but this is an inverted uh, imaging. So this is in keeping with a, a pleural effusion. So here is the needle that we have injected directly into a right inguinal lymph node on the right side. And here are some of the lymphatic channels outlined by the contrast. And if you can see, uh, there are some uh, droplets of uh, lipodol traveling up here at the subclavian region and then it disappears uh, somewhere here. So it's showing that it drains into the uh, thoracic duct and into the right uh, subclavian vein. So during the study, we did not see any uh, irregular or any abnormal uh, contrast uh, leakage uh, into the chest cavity. So again, in this study, we couldn't uh, delineate any uh, leak, okay? So then we proceeded with a lymphosintigraphy. How is this different with a lymphangiogram is that uh, the patient becomes the source of the radiation compared to a lymphangiogram where we pass through radiation to obtain images. So in this study, uh, we used a um, agent called a nanocolloid, which is a very small molecule that can travel within the lymphatic channels. And we tag it with a technetium-99 metastable, which is a radioactive material that would emit a radiation that we can detect with our ca camera. So we inject a very small amount into the first web space of the right hand. And also we wanted to see the thoracic duct. So therefore we injected both interdigital spaces of both feet. And then we take um, um, a planar images at subsequent uh, time frames. Okay. Uh, so here is a schematic anatomy of why we've chosen the right side. Um, the thoracic duct can produce leak on either side uh, of the chest wall, but um, the right side which drains into the right sacral vein would also uh, produce a leak if there is any. So here are the images from this patient study. Uh, I will just um, um, navigate you through the images. This is a, a planar imaging taken in anterior and posterior uh, at 35 minutes post-injection. So the very intense uptake that you see here are the uh, uptake within the interdigital or web spaces that we injected. So these are the injection sites. So this is uh, the hand. So here you can see uh, already some um, lymphatic um, uh, outline uh, up the popliteal and into the inguinal. So this we believe is one of the inguinal nodes that has taken up uh, uptake with the nanocolloid. So, but if you look, this is the area of the chest. Uh, if you imagine like there's a patient standing here. So this would be the area of the chest. So we do not see any um, uptake um, 
or, or any abnormal tracer, abnormal or any uh, uptake within the chest at this uh, 35 minutes. So then we waited for a much longer time where this image is anterior and posterior taking at two hours and 35 minutes. It shows that already now the uh, up the um, nanocolloid has traveled to the right axillary region and there is um, a small uh, uptake, oops, sorry, a small uptake adjacent to it that we were not sure whether this is um, within the axillary region or within the chest wall. Okay, so we waited for a bit more time and six hours post-injection. This is the outline of the liver, which is a physiological in a lymphocentigraphy study. Um, this is the uh, uptake of the nanocolla in the right axillary region, uh, likely as we know. And here you can see some irregular abnormal uptake. Here is the anterior view and posterior view, which um, cannot be denied. But again, we do not see any um, uptake in the, in the chest cavity. So how do we uh, ascertain where is this uh, irregular abnormal uptake? So we then proceeded with a SPECT CT where we combine the um, gamma information with CT. So here is the three dimension, uh, see is the um, axial, uh, sagittal and uh, coronal sections. I'll just navigate you through. So the, the, the top three images are the CT only images. The middle one are the, uh, from the planar, uh, from the, um, uh, uh, SPECT images, okay? So only uh, gamma information. And then the last one is where we do fusion. We fuse the CT and the, and the gamma information. So when we look at the irregular um, uh, accumulation of um, uptake, we map it to the uh, SPECT CT and we see that it's somewhere just inside, oops, sorry, somewhere just inside the chest wall. And um, it is uh, somewhere near the third rib, and it's definitely not part of the um, axillary region, but somewhere a bit uh, within the, the chest cavity. But then again, even at six hours, we don't see any um, uh, significant amount of uh, trace uptake within the pleural cavity. So, considering this patient's um, clinical um, background and everything, so this is the likely a suspicious site of leak. Okay, so in this patient's um, um, case, we can learn two things in terms of lymphocytography versus lymphangiography is that in, in lymphocytography, it's much easier to perform. You just need to inject at the web spaces and it can detect slowly because you can do uh, imaging up to six hours, even 12 hours. But uh, as you have seen in my images, the resolution are much lower. In lymphangiography, uh, we can bypass the long channels, for example, the long channels of lymphatic vessels in the, in, the, in the limbs, in the lower limbs, for example, we can direct inject into the inguinal node, for example. So it gives you a, a much um, uh, a faster uh, imaging study. Uh, but it's slightly more difficult to perform because you need to um, inject a very slow rate and with steady hand inject into the lymph node. Um, and also it does produce every events where the lipodol, if you use too much of it, it can actually um, cause pul pulmonary embolism into the lungs. And But all in all, you have image of better resolution through the spot radiograph. And also you can um, adjunct it with a CT scan probably the next day to see if there's any presence of lipodol uh, inside the pleural cavity or in the abdomen. Um, th that's the end of my slide. Thank you. Aida, can I just ask uh, between the lymphangiosyntigraphy and lymphangiogram, one of them can actually sometimes block slowly, is that right? Yes, correct. That would be the leopodol because it causes inflammation, lymphangitis, or even um, inflammation of the node itself. So somehow that is has a side effect of being a therapeutic effect. See, that's it. Fine. Okay, I'll invite Dr. Boone to share the slides back again and we'll continue on. Okay, so we'll move on to the next slide. So now I'd like to invite uh, our cardiothoracic surgeon, uh, Mr. Isham, to share his slides. Uh, Dr. Ratika, would you like to uh, wonder why we refer to the cardiothoracic surgeon and what can they offer? If uh, we were to... If this patient has failed a uh, conservative treatment, um, we will refer to the cardiothoracic surgeon so that they can do uh, for the with regards to cardiothorax, then they can uh, they can perform a embolization or ligation of the thoracic of the duct lymphatic drainage. Lymphatic duct. 
Okay, so you're talking about thoracic duct ligation. I suppose yeah, this is in this sense, um, uh, the lymphangiogram and the lymphangiosintigraphy does not show an obvious lead. But I would like now to invite uh, Mr. Isham to share his slides and to bring us through what can be done from the cardiothoracic point of view in a patient with chylothorax. Mr. Isham, thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, Michael. Very good morning. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Indria and the team to invite me to talk a bit about what happened to this patient. And uh, Dr. Jatika was right that they referred to us for any surgical intervention to be done for this patient after failed uh, conservative management. But um, that is some surgical point of view. So embolization for the thoracic duct is um, unfortunately not by me, not by a cardiac surgeon. It's, uh, I will discuss it a bit later. All right, what we know so far, 69 years old woman, uh, known uh, case of b cell lymphoma of colon 16 years ago and was in complete remission, presented with left pleural effusion and pleural drainage was chylothorax. And radiological examination, uh, the just like Dr. Aida said, a lymphoid uh, scintigraphy showed abnormal tracer accumulate in the lateral aspect of the right third rib, and she had a negative whole body uh, PET scan. So uh, probably there's a probably of a leakage at the right third rib, and uh, there is no other leakage as to from the thoracic duct and as such. So. Um, Prof. Andy Alkin had done a conservative management by a low-fat diet, KMBM put on TPN and started on etotrite. So um, the chylothorax recur. So there is, a, there is a role for surgical management for this patient. So um, surgical procedure for this patient is VATS, video assisted thoracoscopic surgery. Uh, we put on cameras, we see what's what inside the, cam inside the thorax cavity, and then we proceed. Okay, right. Um, interestingly, the leakage, the suspected leakage is at the right third rib. Okay, so we, we asked the radiologist to inject a methylene blue dye in the right hand and we wait if there is, if you can see the leakage from inside. So then you can intervene. And uh, the finding was there's a right chylothorax, but one liter in the right thorax, severe addition between lung lobes and parietal pleura, anterior, medial, and apical regions, inflamed and thickened parietal pleura throughout. And we found that there is no discoloration any part of thoracic wall cavity after two hours of post injection of the methylene blue. If you can see, any blabs or any signs of a leakage so that we can intervene after two hours. In fact, it's not two hours, it's more than two hours, nearly three hours, in fact. Then we can either explore and then we can try to ligate or just ablate. Unfortunately, we cannot see any, any part of it inside, inside the thorax cavity. And we cannot go for single lung ventilation for so long. Yeah, when we were so, so, so long during this, this uh, surgery. So at, at the end of the three hours, we just uh, do some additional lysis during, during, the, during the surgery, additional lysis, further the thoracic so that the lungs can expand very further and put a tuck paralysis and put a positive pressure during after the surgery so that the lack of space in the pleural cavity so that the pleural disease will work very well. So that was the finding, and that was what's done during the surgery. Prof. India, anything to say, Prof. India? I, I no. Uh, thank you, Mr. Isham. Uh, I, I think this. Uh, you may continue. I have nothing to say at this point. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, right. This is for uh, for for the sake of medical students. Um, as simple as uh, this anatomy. The wet is the thoracic duct is about three three six to forty five centimeters in length, five millimeter in diameter. Starting from citrally cali from, from below the diaphragm, pierces the diaphragm at the level of T12, ascend the posterior and superiorly at the posterior metastinum, at between the thoracic and uh, thoracic aorta and also the azygous vein. 
to the root of the neck and drains inside the left subclavian and T5. It drains about four to five liters of limbs per day. This is mainly from the lower limb, from the left side of the, uh, uh, of the neck and uh, head, and also the left side of the arm. For the right side, most of it on the right side and uh, left, uh, so right uh, uh, head and right thorax, we drain inside the uh, area between the right jugular trunk and the right circulatory trunk. This is apparent during the uh, uh, Dr. Aida Viduri's um, presentation just now. And uh, as before, Dr. Boon has highlighted that the, not, the chylothorax, any, any leakage from the chyle lymph inside the thorax is called chylothorax. And uh, as before, Dr. Boon said that there's a lot of etiology for chylothorax, it's either traumatic, and non-traumatic, 56% of 60% um, of the literature showed that it's from traumatic in etiology, and about 40% following a uh, procedure, a surgical procedure, and others from trauma. There's a few like 40 to 30, 30, 40% of the etiology in the literature come from a non-traumatic, um, for instance, secondary to malignancies in the chest. Lymphoma is one of it. So overall, well, how, how do we manage chylothorax? Most of it uh, has been done by, by Dr. Boone and the, the, the team. Um, in the literature, 40, 42 to 79 percent successfully treated by conservative management alone by, by uh, Dr. Boone uh, and also Prof. Andrea. And the success rate of prolosis is 83 percent. Some centers say 95 percent. Uh, we see that autotype, uses of autotype, is uh, useful in adjunct in treatment, reducing the chylothorax volume, patients with higher volume of chylothorax. In this case, it's the same. It's about, uh, more than uh, one liter, about, about that, per day. So this is, this is uh, very useful. And thoracic duct embolization is one of, one of it in the literature. I think this one is done by radiologists. Uh, it is success rate is more traumatic than non-traumatic chylothorax, and the success rate overall is about 27 and 68%, depends on, depends on the, probably in the, during the discussion with the, with the panel, we can furthermore discuss about this. So surgical management, by part, my part, is uh, at the end of it is a field man a conservative management. What we do is uh, thoracic duct ligation with treatment and choice for surgical patients. Uh, with a success rate of 95%, up to 95%, depending on, on the centers. We do it by vet surgery, not open. And except for this case, except for this case, we know that the possible leak is at the third leak. So that when we do not do the uh, thoracic ventilation, okay, we directly uh, try to visualize where is the leak, possibly from the third uh, rib space, uh, which is none. And we do not proceed with the dilation because uh, lympho lymphocytography showed only at the level of the inguinal is not going up. So high likely the, the leakage is from there. So that's when we do not uh, do thoracic dilation. Overall, it is a challenging, it's surgical management for collateral is challenging because why? Uh, after field uh, conservative management, uh, usually will really take around two weeks to one month the leak still there. There'll be a lot of addition. Be, the pleura is very thick. So it's a bit difficult to get this area between T8 to T12 at the lower part when, when there's a lot of addition and thick pleura. But as they say, as high as 95% plus duct ligation treatment for such. Okay, all right. Thank you so much. Back to Dr. Andrea Ngo. Okay, thank you, Mr. Isham. Can you stop sharing so that we can share? So, Dr. Ratika, based on uh, Mr. Isham's uh, uh, talk, well, what do you think is the cause of chylothorax in this lady? Likely, the, likely the cause of chylothorax in this lady uh, is due to uh, malignancy. Oh, okay, so you're still yeah. handling for malignancy. Yeah, okay. I'm all looking right. for malignancy. Okay, all right. Can I move on to the next slide, uh, Dr. Poon? 
Okay, so this is the progress of the patient. Uh, we did talk through this is with uh, CPAP. Uh, the effusion did not recur, but a few months later, she developed chylus uh, ascites. And um, uh, based on that, uh, she actually had a symptomatic peritoneal synthesis. So we will discuss this at the panel discussion. But for the moment, I think, uh, Dr. Ratika, you are right. Um, uh, collectively, as a team, there was this worry about the underlying malignancy. So she did undergo periodic surveillance PET CT. And I'm not I'll invite Dr. Aida to show some colored image now. Can I share? You have to stop share, Dr. Okay, thanks. Okay, so these are the serial uh, maximum intensity projection images of four PET CTs done in chronological order of this patient. So, Dr. Ratika, would you like to um, comment? Aida, um, looking at the serial PET CT, um, there's hyper there's increased uptake over the ascending, descending transverse columns. Uh, yes. But um, I think there's multiple lymph node involvement too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so the first image is. There. Oh, yeah, this one. The right upper chest. Yeah. Uh, so I'll just walk through these PET images. So the, initially, with the, the patient came with a background history of lymphoma and we wanted to look for any signs of malignancy from the PET. So um, usually, the cervical lymph nodes do not have uh, increased uptake, but in this patient, it does have in a rather symmetrical and bilateral manner. Uh, looking at the CT images that is done uh, during the PET CT, these nodes tend to be very small uh, normal with normal morphology and normal size lymph nodes, although they have slight increase in metabolic activity. So uh, at this point of time, um, to say that they are due to malignancy is rather um, uh, inconclusive, uh, rather not true because uh, of the morphology and also it can also still be due to other infections or even a reactive nodes. So uh, other, other observation that we saw on the first PET CT was the increased uptake uh, in the um, a transverse colon and in the ascending colon. And it appears to be quite focal. And uh, this patient is on oral hypo and oral hypoglycemic agents. So we know that oral hypoglycemic agents in, can have uh, increased uptake inside the uh, bowels um, in PET city. So we we were on the cautionary side. Um, so um, of as of to the inc uh, focally increased uptake in the in the in the large bowel. Apart from that, uh, there was also a focal increased uptake within the um, fundus of the stomach. It's probably not clear here because this is a um, maximum intensity projection images. But if you were to look at the um, uh, PET CT slices, you'll be able to see that there was a focal increased uptake in the uh, um, uh, in the uh, stomach. So I think after the first PET CT, there were a few investigations done. Um, Right, Dr. Ratika? Uh, she says yes. yes. Okay, okay so if we if we follow on to the serial PET CT images, then we start to see that there is um, a dis uh, abnormal um, um, metabolic activity of the cervical and also axillary nodes. And it appears to be increasing in size and increasing in metabolic activity with a few more nodes that are um, new um, in the in the in the um, lower axillary region on both sides. Okay, so as you can see here, the uptake in the bowel is fairly um, consistent. So and as the um, patient has already had OGDS and it turned out to be normal. So these are uh, likely just due to uh, the uh, OHA of the patient. Okay, so um, if you can see these two PET CT images, they are this abnormal looking, oops, abnormal looking uh, linear hypermetabolic activity, which corresponds to the plural uh, talc um, inflammation reaction around the, uh, at the plural cavity, at the plura, where the plural 
cat pleura disease was performed. So these are just um, um, uh, inflammatory uh, hypermotable activity rather than malignancy. And I think after treatment, uh, finally, the last uh, patch shows that there is complete resolution of the hypermetabolic uh, lymph nodes in the cervical region and axillary nodes. And uh, this... Okay, uh, anything more about that? I'm oh, okay. <laughs> so I just, I just want to show that this shows a nice uh, metabolic activity in the intercostal muscle. So these are not uh, the ribs, the, not the bones. They are actually in the intercostal muscles. And if you look here, they're also in the um, abdominal muscle. So it shows that the patient is using her accessory muscles more, um, probably trying to overcome the ascites and the left-sided pleurofusion. Can I stop share? Yes, please. Okay, so... Uh, that, uh, what do you think is the next step, Ratika, that we will want to do for this patient? Since based on the PET scan, um, uh, based on the procedure PET scan, I would request for a lymph node biopsy. Since we've already done a colonoscopy in OGDS, which shows normal. All right. So I would like to invite uh, Dr. Wan Shahira to now share her slides. Uh, and she may ask you some questions, Ratika. We're not sure about that. Yeah. Okay. Hi, uh, Assalamualaikum and good morning. Uh, so, I will now discuss about the histopathological examination of the lymph node. The lymph node that we uh, received measured 12 mm in diameter, which we entirely submitted for examination. Okay, sorry. Uh, I need to reshare this one. No problem. So for, while, waiting sorry for about this. Um, while waiting for you to share, maybe we'll just say that um, so the chylothorax part uh, is quite rare. I just want to tell everyone that, okay? Rather than using it's a daily basis thing. Okay, I think we can see your slides now. All right. So the big uh, picture is the biopsy of this patient and the small picture in um, red is what we expect to see in a normal patient, in a, a, a normal person. So, uh, Dr. Ratika, would you like to um, describe what you can see in the patient's uh, biopsy? Um, thanks, Dr. Shahira. From, from comparing a normal biopsy and the patient's bi limb node biopsy, uh, you can see that those uh, follicles, nodular-like follicles, the architecture is literally effaced and it's very diffuse, generalized. The whole thing, whole architecture is gone, is, is effaced. Yeah, that's correct. So in a, a benign limb node, we expect to see an intact architecture of the limb node with a cortex on the outside and medulla at the center. And within the cortex, we expect to see some reactive lymphoid follicles, which have some um, dark zone and light zone. So, but in this patient, as you can see, the whole architecture is lost. We can hardly see where the demarcation is between the cortex and the medulla. And the follicles, although they are still some present, they are so small and they are very unconvincing. And in some areas, for example, at the bottom here, there's complete loss of the uh, uh, lymphatic follicles. And it has been replaced by these very pale, pale colored uh, cells. So we examine at a higher power, to look at the cells and comparing what normal uh, lymph node look like, usually uh, the lymph node in this area should be small and dark, like here. But as you can see in this patient, the cells they are big and pale and huge and um, it's effaced, diffusely effaced and you can't see the lymphoid follicle which we expect to see in a normal uh, patient. The lymphoid follicle is very small. So it has been disrupted. So these uh, cells are behaving in a malignant uh, fashion and it has diffusely um, uh, dis destroyed the lymph node. So when we look at higher power, you can see that the cells are huge and if we compare to a normal uh, reactive lymphocyte, this is a reactive lymphocyte here, the cells are actually three times, two to three times bigger than what we see in a reactive lymph node, in a benign uh, lymphocyte. They are pale in color, they have pale nucleus with very prominent nucleoli and we can see a lot of mitosis. This is one here, another one here, another one here, here. Um, 
So when we see a lot of necro uh, mitosis, this is another one here, it indicates that the cells are rapidly proliferating. So this indicates that the tumor is an aggressive type of tumor. So now that we know this, the lymph node is malignant and has been infiltrated by malignant lymphoid cells, next we need to do some stains to delineate uh, what is the type of the uh, lymphoid cells. So first we did some markers to indicate whether this is uh, these tumor cells have a B uh, cell lineage or T cell lineage. Uh, the top pictures are from the patient's um, lymph node and the bottom ones are what we expect to see in a benign uh, lymph node. Dr. Ratika, would you like to comment on these pictures? Um, since uh, we, it, CT20 is a B cell marker comparing to a normal normal histology using the stain seems like uh, it's CD20 positive, but looking at the CD3 mark, which is the T cell markers, um, I think it's negative for the, it's negatively stained. I mean, it's not stained, it's negative for T cell markers. So I think this patient is B cell CD20 positive. Yes, you're right. So the T cell markers, the uh, the way the stains are picking up, it's exactly the same as what we expect to see in a benign lymph node. So this indicates that the T cell marker CD3 is only picking up some reactive benign lymphocytes, as opposed to that all the huge cells that we saw just now are all CD20 positive. So they are expressing B cell markers. So this. Uh, gives us the diagnosis of a B-cell lymphoma with a diffuse pattern and large size morphology. So now that we know this, uh, the type of the lymphoma, we need to do some further stains because the, these stains will indicate the differentiation of the cell and it can, manage, it can affect the management later as well as the prognosis of the patient. So we did some germinal center markers, which are CD10 uh, and BCL6 and uh, Normally, the, the markers will be positive in your follicles. But in our case, the, the tumor cells are all negative. And we did a, a post-germinal center marker, which are expected to see outside of germinal center. And we see that the, the tumor cells are all positive for MUM1. So this indicates that the tumor cells have a post-germinal center expression. So based on, uh -oh, there's another one, which is K67. K67 is a marker to indicate that the cells are proliferating. So um, in a normal lymph node, the proliferation mainly occurs in our follicles. And areas in between the follicles have generally low proliferative uh, ability. But as we can see in our patient, the whole lymph node is picking up the stain, the dark brown colored stains. And um, so we have lost the normal architecture and the whole uh, lymph node is picking up the stain and the proliferative uh, uh, index in this area is about 60 to 70%, which is considered high. Anything above 40% is considered high in uh, lymphoma. So this is a, 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 an aggressive type of lymphoma. So based on the morphology and the stains, we came up with the diagnosis of a diffuse large B cell lymphoma of the activated B cell type or post germinal center subtype. Thank, Thank you, Ahira. Thank you. So uh, we'll now go to the panel discussion. And uh, as you can see, there are two people here who haven't been uh, put on the hot seat. And that's uh, Dr. Kairu Najmi and Dr. Siva Kumar. So in view of uh, the time is running out, uh, you're still not off the hook. We have uh, one question each for you. So in terms of, uh, so uh, I'll give the two questions. You have time to mull over it. Uh, for Najmi, I would like to know um, the chylus ascites and what was the management. And for Dr. Siva Kumar, uh, maybe just comment on the typical or atypical uh, nature of this disease. So maybe I'll invite Dr. Najmi first because uh, Dr. Siva is taking a breather first. Okay, all right, Dr. Najmi. Thank you, Prof. Andre and the team for inviting me. A uh, very interesting case. For in terms of chylus ascites, the, the finding or the presentation is uncommon. Uh, previous study has shown the uh, incident rate uh, in general population is about 1 in 20,000 admission, hospital admission, while in uh, chronic liver disease patient, the incident rate about 0.5%. So in this case, when we see a patient with chylus ascites, 
uh, we need to uh, investigate what the underlying cause. Of course, uh, it can happen in a psychiatric patient uh, who have a portal hypertension due to liver cirrhosis, but we need to rule out uh, the, the other causes. Uh, the most uh, common cause for uh, non-traumatic psychiatric, especially in, in liver cirrhosis, is malignancy. Uh, in terms of management, it's more or less the same as uh, non chylus uh, psychiatric management. Uh, in this case, a bit uh, extra in terms of diet modification. Uh, of course, um, low salt diet, uh, high protein diet, uh, low fat diet with medium chain triglyceride. And sometimes uh, patient might need TPN as well. Uh, otherwise, uh, if patient is symptomatic with a psychiatric, uh, will need large volume paraphrasis with albumin transfusion in, uh, uh, in vivo of this patient. Um, some cases, um, they do a tips in this kind of patient, uh, but the, the complication risk is very high. Um, uh, uh, previous report has shown about 80% of the case, uh, up to one year, they have uh, a thrombosis of the, of the stent. So um, mainly, I think the, the main management is apart from treating the patient symptomatically, we need to find out exactly what's the underlying cause of the chiris cystitis. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Najmi. Yeah, so it's nice to know that uh, even though the chyle appears in different places, the management is the same. So we can also refer chyle's new, uh, new infusion to you for management. Uh, Dr. Siva, very interesting case. I yeah. think we, we, we had multiple discussions with hematology because we, want, we, were, we were always worried about the background malignancy, right? So right. Yeah, what do you think is a common presentation for this patient, uh, for, for lymphoma? Yeah, okay. Um, thank you, Prof. Thank you uh, for inviting me. Um, so right from the beginning, because um, she had history of lymphoma uh, 13 years, about 17 years ago. Um, so like I mentioned before, um, it, uh, it's, it usually we give a, 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 a range of 10 years uh, for someone to have, uh, because what we worry in someone who has history of lymphoma is the history or risk of relapse. So we were, we normally will tell patients that the first 10 years is the potential risk of relapse. And subsequently, the risk uh, after the 10th year, the risk actually drops to the as the same risk as the normal population. However, she actually relapsed after 17 years. And during this period of time, we were trying very hard to actually get a, a tissue diagnosis. So we did multiple uh, uh, investigations. Um, just to get a tissue diagnosis in, in order for us to actually treat her. We know she has relapsed, but we did not get a tissue diagnosis. So her presentation, usually, uh, if you notice that uh, her first lymphoma, the primary was actually in the gut. Um, so this time around, when she came and then the PET scan, the CT scan showed some hypermetabolic changes in the sun. In fact, um, gastro had repeatedly gone, gone in and did um, um, uh, OGDS, colonoscopy, did random biopsies, but we just couldn't uh, catch the uh, atypical lymphoid cells. So uh, after subsequent PET scan, that's when we actually picked up. In fact, even the pleura, even the pleura, multiple times we actually biopsy the pleura, the chylothorax, we sent off for cytology, uh, still were not able to pick up. So um, uh, only uh, towards the, the PET scan, I think the third PET scan or second PET scan, we managed to pick up the axillary leaf nodes. And from biopsy from that, that's when uh, we managed to pick up. So the presentation-wise uh, is actually very rare, very, very rare. Um, uh, we have not seen, um, I mean, in the last five to five, ten years, we have not seen somebody with a chylothorax presenting with a relapsed lymphoma. But then again, it's not unusual. Uh, you still uh, need to think of lymphoma in the background. Um, so just a little bit, uh, a very quick uh, on the management. So some, so basically she said relapsed lymphoma. So what she ideally needs to be done, what needs to be done for her is basically what we will do is we will restage her. First, of course, the diagnosis, then restage, and then we will do a pre-chemo workup. And then we will plan for treatment. And this time around, uh, we need to give her what we call a salvage chemotherapy. Uh, ideal for the patient and prepare her for an autologous transplant. So that would have been an ideal uh, uh, principle of treatment for this patient. Okay, thank you, Dr. Siva. Uh, we, we want to keep the time, so we'll give Dr. Ng Boon Hao three minutes to sum up the case. So as you realize, the person who ends this will be the most important person. Right? Well, let me uh, share my slides.
Thank you, all the panelists. Uh, they have uh, a great discussions, and uh, well, I need to summarize to uh, yeah to the audience that uh, well, this is a sixty nine year old woman with refractory chirothorax. Um, the median gen triglyceride uh, diet restrictions have not successful, and a serial workout, including the lymphangiography, lymphangiography, and surgical explorations, mm -hmm. has not able to detect the leak. And to bear in mind, she has underlying diffulus B cell lymphoma. Uh, well, uh, why uh, refractory character is so important? Because uh, this condition uh, leading to a nutritional loss in the patients. At the same time, when the chylus accumulate in the pure space, it increases the risk of pure infections. And well, to the medical students, uh, uh, chylothorax are uh, Macroscopically, look like the Mickey like appearance. And the gold standard to diagnose the chirotorage uh, will be the life reporting analysis, which is not routinely done in our centers. Well, you have other substitutes like pure food triglycerides with a color of 1.24 millimole per liter as a diagnostics of for chirotorax. And I still need to emphasize to you uh, when you see the patient with chirotorax to narrow down your diagnosis by thinking the what is the differential diagnosis and the approach should be targeted to the differential diagnosis. And for these patients, um, well, I need to uh, say that uh, the management of refractory cardiothorax should be individualized. Okay, uh, As for her, we had tried the median strength triglyceride, we had tried the, uh, the top disease with the CPAP. The reason being CPAP because they can empty the pure space at the same time. You can bring the brighter and the cost of pure together so you achieve the symbiosis. So other treatment of the refractory chirothorax include the chemical purgesis as I mentioned, as we did in these patients, or, also, or, or we can perform the percutaneous or retrograde lymphatic embolization. This is what we, our, our Dr. Ida, radiologist, had mentioned. Uh, by using the Vipioto uh, through the lymphangiography. Uh, our surgeon, Mr. Hisham, said he, he offered the thoracic duct ligation. However, uh, there's no leakage being identified. So uh, combination therapy includes the top pyresis uh, with uh, continual positive airway pressures, or the, you can combine the drug, right, somatostatin with thoracic ligation together with the uh, pyridesis. Always bear in mind, um, Test tube is not routinely inserted for the patient with chirothorax because this were leading to uh, nutritional loss. And as for this patient, you can see we take a long journey to follow up her. And as we know, for chirothorax, we should always hunt for the underlying etiology and treat the underlying etiologies rather than solely treat on this chirothorax. Yeah, I'll pass back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boon. Okay, move on to the next slide. Okay, now uh, I'd like to pass uh, to Dr. Uh, to Anjit Buhari. We will have the kahoot for the medical students. Uh, okay, and, uh, and there will be a prize for the, the person who gets uh, the, the highest mark. Can you please meet me in uh, Magma Pumrex on ground floor and I'll give you a prize. Thank you. The panelists will get chocolates from me later. No worries. Wow, thank you, Prof. Thank you. Okay, saya so sebelum kita mula kahut, saya share dulu um, ni eh untuk CPD point ya eh, untuk doktor saya. Eh. Gu uh, gunakan uh, apps uh, apps MME ya. Eh. Okay. While people are scanning, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all the panelists uh, who've actually woken up early, dressed well, and come here and contributed uh, to the success of uh, this CPC. Thank you very much, guys.
Okay, thank you. Uh, I've taken a photo of the person with the top mark, so please come and get your prize from me. Right. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining. I realize it's a nine o six, and we have a lot of other things to do. So the take home message is chylothorax is rare. Right. So you think about the simple things first for medical students. I noticed in the first answer, some answered the uh, likes criteria wrongly. Uh, so you know that's not true, right? Likes criteria should be at the back of your hand. You should know that. Okay. Thank you, everyone. So for the panelists. Uh, can you switch on your camera? We'll take a picture because I've uh, never seen you guys looking so good before. Okay. <laughs> okay, good job. Huh? Let me just. Uh, which one? Full screen. Okay, all right. Okay, one, two. <coughs> eh, Nachmi tak ada. He left. Okay, that will be put his photo in. Back in Matsi. Okay, Encik Bukhari, thank you very much for being so patient with us. Yes, the deep Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Everybody. Thanks. Okay. Bye, Mr. Sham. Aida, thank you for driving all the way to UTM. Bye. <laughs> I deserve more chocolates. Okay, okay. Yeah, I understand. Get more chocolates. <laughs> bye. Che Buhari, kita tak payah isi attendance link, attendance list tu last kali ke? Can I see? Can I see? Can I see? Okay, okay, okay. Can I, can I? Attendance link semua isi. Yeah, otherwise you won't get anything out of this. Dapat, dapat jam latihan, ya? Yeah? Uh-huh. Let's start with Facebook. Okay, semua jadi saya akan end session. Terima kasih.